I like to bring H.P. Lovecraft into this series of videos because I like to use his view of the universe as an example of a truly hellish one. Um, his universe is full of the supernatural and um, it, uh, it illustrates a universe in which we're pretty much doomed before the human race ever even came into existence. Um, but there's a, one that's closer to reality. I won't say that it's real, but it is closer to reality of a truly hellish universe. And it underpinned a civilization, that of the ancient Greeks. The one illustrated in this book, the Iliad of Homer. Homer wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad. And um, that illustrated essentially the ancient Greeks' world view there that was basically the closest thing that the ancient Greeks had to a Bible or a Quran or whatever. Um, it illustrated what they thought uh, was the way of the universe. And that to me is a hellish universe that they put together. The ancient Greeks were very cognizant of the fact that human life could be essentially tragic. They were well known for their tragedies which showed um, enormous um, that gave it great attention to the tragedy that uh, human life could sometimes become. Greek tragedy has come down to us to this day as uh, superb. In Homer, the, the characters in Homer are bound by um, conflicting moral codes which results in a massive catch-22 which um, leads one to think that the universe, the, the cosmos that they lived in was not worth living in, if you ask me. It was pretty hellish. Um, they were bound by conflicting moral and ethical systems. That was what made it so awful. That was what made it so catch-22. They lived in a warrior society. They had warrior ethics. In other words, um, love your friends and do harm to your enemies. Uh, show honor on the battlefield. Never show, um, never show uh, cowardice. And most importantly, at least in terms of the storyline, Honor is important. Honor and revenge. So, um, that's one ethical system. That's one moral code. The other one was, do what the gods say. Um, that's practically impossible, and the Greeks understood this, or they emphasized this, that w d determining the will of the gods is nearly impossible. The only thing that you can really do is don't go out of your way to overtly um, disrespect them. But you could do anything that could uh, insult them and you could be crushed at any given moment. And if you ask me, that was the way that the ancient Greeks came to terms with the randomness of existence. And the third moral slash ethical system that they were subjected to was their own conscience as human beings. Now this is what made things truly awful. Because human conscience and warrior ethics don't necessarily work together. They often conflict, but the characters in Homer are equally bound by them. Um, the warrior ethic says you must destroy your enemies. You must show revenge. Don Corleone's line, uh, revenge is a dish best served up cold. Even if you had to wait years for it, you would get your revenge. Um, a lot of the Revulsion, I suppose, that the Western world now sees towards uh, the Islamic world is the fact that the West simply can't wrap its head around this idea of honor and revenge. Um, it explains a lot of Islamic attitudes towards the West, even though it's not really anything to do with Islam. It has to do with the cultures that uh, Islam has been imposed upon or superimposed over. Uh, the warrior who is who is, uh, whose system demands that he be ruthless to his enemies also has a conscience, also feels pity, also understands that his warrior code puts him in absurd situations. Someone has offended his honor that he knows this person, the, 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 that the offender did not mean to, uh, to offend his honor or to uh, put him in a situation where he had to act in a vengeful manner, but his warrior code says that he's got to do it, but his conscience says what I'm doing is pointless violence. There's so much of that in, uh, in Homer. And again, to the Greeks, that illustrated the fundamental tragedy of existence. Which moral code is a human being supposed to follow? Um, 
it's it illustrates the idea that um, okay, uh, even let's say we attempt to make moral judgments every second of every day, which is essentially what we have to do. What's the right thing to do at any given moment? Again, we're we're sitting on Arjuna's uh, chariot in the middle of the battle of Kurukshetra with Krishna telling us um, uh, uh, what exactly the universe is all about and what is expected of us. And um, at any given second, there's another moral choice to be made and we're inclined to just sit down and start crying because it's impossible. But again, the the backdrop of the battlefield where things are happening so quickly and uh, so much is at stake in Homer, you can't do that. You've still got to act. You make whatever decision you can in the midst of chaos and massive and sudden and irreversible change. And regardless of whether or not you've got complete information, you will be judged for what you've done. There's no way out. You're stuck. You're stuck in a, in a universe that demands that you behave morally in which it's almost impossible to do it because you don't have all the facts at your fingertips to make the proper moral choice and the second you are overwhelmed by one moral decision another one comes along that to the Greeks was the tragedy of existence why is it that we cannot decide what moral code what ethical code we want to live by the antinatalist argument says that one is playing God when one decides to have children. I can understand the logic behind that. I'm bringing something into existence that um, I may not have the, 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 the capacity to, uh, to influence or to protect from the dreadful things that may or may not happen to him or her. Uh, simply by virtue of the fact that I'm bringing them into existence. Let's say that they have a congenital deformity or some kind of terrible uh, uh, chronic condition. I don't know, but I'm gambling that that's not going to happen. That's fine. Um, but again, when you judge someone for doing something like that, you're saying that what they're doing is wrong, and remember that is at the uh, the, the the moral implications of breeding is at, at the heart of the antinatalist argument. Say that we must judge someone for doing this, even though um, this person may be doing it for the best of intentions. This person may be simply attempting to do what makes the most sense to them uh, at that moment, um, that and and then they are willing to make every single moral choice along the road with incomplete information um, on something that they ultimately have no control over. In other words, how many things can go wrong as a parent when I'm trying to raise a child? How many things can go wrong? How many things can I really control? And yet the antinatalist is saying that I'm ultimately responsible, even if I cannot control that, even if I cannot control what um, uh, befalls that child, even if I can only control a, a little tiny amount of that, then they say, well, don't have kids. Well, wait a minute. That's all, all very well for, for someone outside of that situation to say, because that person may have morally impeccable reasons for having children. But again, the moral choices have to be made constantly and in real time throughout your entire life. I think that the antinatalist is attempting to put two contradictory moral systems, moral judgmental systems upon the parent, um, and is in a sense, in a sense, by judging the parent for playing God, is doing something even more, um, uh, even more demanding by judging the parent for being God. When I say um, I'm going to do my best in life as a parent. That's fine. Okay, let's. That is laudable. I think most of us agree with that. Let's say that another voice says, "Doesn't matter. That's not enough. You're still bad, even though you're trying hard. You're still what you've done is you've created something that you knew you had no control over, and what you've done is bad and immoral and ultimately depraved." Who's playing God? The human being who's making every possible moral decision uh, with the w best possible intentions? Or the person who says, that will never be enough? Who 
is playing God? The person that's doing their best or the person who's telling the person who's doing their best that it's never going to be enough? It's an interesting point of view, isn't it? When you look at the number of conflicting moral and ethical demands that are placed on us in real time from the moment we're born till the moment we're in our graves. Thank you.